שירוק מכסה, והמרחב נפתח בעיניה, עיניה נפתח לשמיש. טוב, שבת שלום, good evening, שבת שלום. Thank you very much, Katalin, for inviting me. Thank you uh, all for taking this Shabbat off from wherever you uh, were supposed to be. Uh, I know that it is a first time experience for me. Tonight it was my first prayer ever in a synagogue <laughs> of first <laughs> temple of first century. So it was very exciting. Um, because of the welcoming words of Kathleen, I wanted to say something which is not immediately jumping into the theme for which we are convened here. I wanted to reflect on something that she said and then to reflect on something that I heard before from the sisters. Um, the first thing is that for Israelis, and some of the Israelis that are here, Israeli Jewish women that are here, and also for the men, but Israeli uh, women is that usually we think of ourselves as very, very strong and tough and practical. And this thing of taking flowers on our head and talking about the silence and the contemplative life is something that Israelis have to learn. It has to do maybe with our history, with modern history. So I think you are very brave, you Israeli women that have come and decided to put aside cynicism, which I can tell you, among, of my, among my, my family and friends, there would be people that would sit like this. Hmm, where is that going? So I thank you for being open for that. And yeah, that's, that's OK. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, because you see they're clapping because they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, then the other thing is when the sisters from uh, Gaza were speaking about life and having a minority which is encouraged by your presence, your love, and sharing music. I was thinking very much, and I will ask forgiveness from my husband who sits here, that I will tell the story of his mother. And why is that? Because we asked you, I asked the question about the genius of women who live in traditional society. And I don't mean women that became engineers and doctors, which is great but it's probably the family that already showed them that option. I'm talking about women who never saw that option. And I'm so um, curious and inspired after I hear their stories of those who despite the, the world around them made something with their lives. And I can tell you, I don't think Mary Magdalene was an engineer, and Mary, the mother of God, was not a physician, but they must have done something which showed their inner strengths in a society that was traditional. So I was very lucky, privileged to marry my husband, who comes from a Yemenite family. His parents came from Yemen. So excuse me for taking five minutes to tell you this story, but that is also where I'm driven to find the inner uh, strength of women of faith, of great faith. And his mother was full of faith. So she grew up in Yemen, in a society that was very traditional, pretty much like the surrounding population, which was a Muslim a conservative society. So she was married to somebody at the age of 13 and she used to run away every morning back to her parents 
and they would pretty much pull her in her hairs or her ears to go back to that man, which she clearly, clearly did not love. After probably hellish four years, he threw her, <laughs> saying, this woman is sterile, she has no children, what am I to do with this rebellious, sterile person? Nobody would want her. She was already wedded, so that's not somebody you want to take. And apparently she, she wasn't a big deal if she was thrown out of a family. It was at that moment that my husband's father, my father-in-law, who loved her from a very, very young age, they would usually meet all the children in that Yemenite village called Khiyarie. When I asked her, where is this Khiyarie? She said, oh, it's two days walk from Thais. And I'm like, where is Thais? But clearly it's two days walk from Khiyarie. So they would play around the well and he loved her, but he was an orphan, he was a poor man. She came from a better family. There was no chance that he will marry her, but he was wedded to her aunt. Her aunt was for some reason not very much wanted, or I don't know what, sorry, I don't know what was the problem. No, I don't want to be disrespectful. But his name, by the way, was Salem, which is Shalom, which is peace. And he was married to Isaac's mother's aunt, whose name was Rachel, Rachel. Then, after having three children, and the person that comes to help with the three children is Itzik's mother. So it's the niece of Rachel. But now that she's thrown out, Salem says, I want her. Nobody wants her, but he wants her. And in Yemen, it was okay to have polygamy. So he takes her in the house. So now can you imagine an aunt and a niece married? And in one year, she is going to give birth to Yaakov, Jacob. The second pregnancy in a year and a half will be Isaac, my husband, Yitzhak. In three years, she's going to have Yigal. In four years, <laughs> she's going to have Aviva. And the fifth pregnancy, the twins, Nurit and Oti. So altogether, there are nine children in the family, two wives who clearly have no love to each other until the very end, I'm sorry. And in this lifestyle, when they come to the Holy Land, which is Zion for them, they have this opportunity, so this whole tribe comes and they have absolutely no skills in this world that we live here. So they are getting, as usually the Jewish agency would do, a cow and some chickens, and okay, start being farmers. And almost until the last day of her life, she worked and worked and worked and worked, and she was no engineer and she was no doctor. And she had all the problems of raising six children who in few years knew better Hebrew than she did. She spoke to, be, to me in Hebrew, which I couldn't understand, mm -hmm. because all the grammar was Arabic Yemenite grammar in Hebrew words. And of course she was illiterate, so here the newcomers were taught how to read, and there was a newspaper with these vowels, dots, that she could uh, learn a little bit how to to, do, to understand what's going on. But what I want to tell you is that she is one of the most powerful women that I have ever known. She lived in a place where there was no terminology for feminism or the genius of women. This was not a discourse present. It was a male, traditional, conservative, Patriarchal society, but the way she raised up six children to become 
what my brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law are? The best of the best, the salt of the earth. So where did that come from? So if I'm seeking for the strength of women, it's within the constraints. We all have some limits around us. And how do we bring about the best in the face of all these hardships that we have? And I don't have hardships. If I compare my life to hers, ridiculous. I don't know the word hardship. I can just say it. I don't know what it means. So it's quite amazing. When I look back and I'm thinking about all these mothers that we had, and when I'm speaking about our mothers, for me, immediately comes Sarah and Rebecca and Leah and Rachel. And you can add the rest. By the way, my name, Yiska, is a biblical name. I hope you know. I'm in the book of Genesis, chapter 11. <laughs> and I am the niece of Abraham. And according to the Midrash, I was wedded to Abraham. So Yiska, in the religious Jewish world, if you say Yiska, immediately, immediately comes the uh, synonym. Oh, Sarah. If I say, I'm Yiska, and I'm asking, do you know that name? Secular people say, what? Is it a Russian name? How do you write it? If I say it to religious people, they say, oh, Sarah. So this thing of being betrothed to your uncle, okay. That's common at the time. To have polygamy, it's common. To be sort of rightsless, having no rights, that's, that's okay. That's the common thing. So what, what is the role of women? So when you say in Hebrew that the woman is the column of the house, I can say that that is true. And why is that true? Sometimes it is a way to push the woman just to be a column and not to be something else. But if these are the constraints, so let's be a column. And I could see Kadia, my late mother-in-law, being very much a column. And I will now take it straight to Shabbat. Maybe in the times of Jesus, we did not sing Lecha Dodi and Matovu Alecha Yaakov, and maybe these things developed, pretty much as I heard is also the case of the Catholic liturgy. I heard that uh, different hymns like uh, Pangelingua or uh, Adoro Te Devote is not really from biblical times, right? <laughs> Thomas Aquinas is somewhat later. So I think it's parallel that we have many of our hymns in the times of Thomas of Aquinas and even uh, uh, later. So things developed. But what was there that I know for sure that was in Mary's time and in Mother Sarah's time, I know for sure that women took the role to prepare for Shabbat. And why do I say that for sure? Because it is clear from all our sources that on Shabbat there were many things that we could not do. We were told not to do certain things on Shabbat. One of them is not to ignite fire. Now in a house it's pretty difficult. If there is now, I hope not, electricity uh, breakdown, what do we do? And there's no generator, no nothing. So we really, and there's, there are no matches. So what do we want to have? We want to have a little fire. But if that fire is not made strong to endure many hours, then we are in the dark and it's going to be cold and also the foods are going to be cold. The traditional role of women, two traditional roles were to women. One was to bring water. Women were water providers, but they were also fire providers. They made the fire because they were in charge of what is happening in the house. What we have left till today is that we light candles before Shabbat to signal, for me, this is the way I see it, to signal my role as someone who brings light when dark will come. 
and uh, to be able to have the food warmed. So if there's one thing that I can say about the times of this synagogue, is that after people went back, after the Friday um, prayer, they came home, and you know what? In every home that was here, there was a little fire. I think the word in English is hearth, if I'm not mistaken, hearth, H-E-A-R-T-H, something. So the hearth, which was the home's place with the fire, that was the role of women. So from day to day, they put another wood because they wouldn't bother every day making new light. But for this Shabbat, she had to prepare the fire. And when people came back from the synagogues, the house was ready. And it was ready, I'm sure, in a different way because it was a different day. And that's why I don't like to call it Saturday in English, although I know it's the word in English. Because Saturday reminds me of Saturnus, which is a god and a star and I don't know what. So it's a Sabbath. So if you don't mind, I will just say Sabbath. And every now and then I'll remind you that you call it Saturday, but it's really a Sabbath. It's Shabbat. So going back to Itzik's mother, uh, Shabbat, is that she would come back from the synagogue as all the village did, usually with some herbs that have a very, very good fragrance because it was like a gift for Shabbat. Mm -hmm. And coming back home, the lights were already lit because she lit them before she went to synagogue. And then dark came and the lights were there. So I'm saying something which is trivial, which we do, right? But I could see that for her, it was like she was if not a queen, but a princess. She could come because she already lit the fire. She already did the work. But now as she comes, she's celebrating Shabbat. Now during the Shabbat, as you know, the fire turns off. It's, at some point it becomes dark and cold. And uh, I don't know how many of you lived. Uh, I, I was privileged because in my house, we had what is called a Sabbath clock which means that at 11 o'clock at night, it is turned off automatically. So there was light until 11 Friday. Timer. And, timer. Okay, thank you. Timer. And the next day, the timer would be timed to approximately um, before dark, before we do the Havdalad, what we'll do tomorrow. Um, so I guess in other places where there was not elec no electricity or no timers, it was a bit more tough. And then in times when there were no matches, who would light the light of Motzei Shabbat, of the end of Shabbat? That was the role of men. Because lighting a new light, that's a very effortful activity. It's hard. You have to with the, with the stones. And until today, what we have in tradition is that women light the light of Shabbat, because it is taken from a light that was already there, but it is preparing for Shabbat. And on the end of Shabbat, the men put the light, and the light now is the light of a regular week. So if I want to look and say something spe special about women, the women put the light that will be the light of hallowed, sanctified time. And the men, excuse me, men, you light the light of daily life because you are just, uh, sorry, okay, you are bringing us back to what we call whole daily life. So now I want to move further also to my talk, but again take the strength from um, uh, my mother-in-law, her soul rest in peace. Um, and that is Women who did not read could not take our Sidur and go to page this and page that and read and jump because they have no idea where they are, right? So when I would sit with her in the synagogue, I also was not caring much about the text because I saw the way she was sitting and just hearing. She was participating in hearing. And I know she was participating. There's no question about that but she was participating even more in daily life. 
and what is in daily life, because women take care of the children and of the household, and they need to pray daily for the most basic things, for a child to have his fever go away, for a heartbroken daughter to <laughs> overcome her grief, and many, many other things. So I think women have a connection to prayer which is more domesticated. It's not liturgical necessarily. It is not temple or synagogue prayers. There's also synagogue, there's also temple. But when they pray and they talk to God, they pray because they are trying to get the best for their family. I would say their prayer is not based on structured text. The prayer is based on the heart asking for something. And that brings me directly, and that's the page that you have here, of Samuel, book of, first book of Samuel, chapter 2. And this is the story of Hana. Anna, Anna. And um, I certainly don't uh, want to read now all of it because it's going to take much of our time. But I want to say that in the story of Hannah, I have two models of prayer. So this is one model, and that is when Hannah prayed and said, now that she has a child, she says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. The horn is the way we made music before there were other musical instruments, right? Pretty much your clarinet, your bassoon. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. So Hannah here is very, very uh, verbal. She's with an exquisite possibility to be poetic, to, to say all these beautiful things about God and amending of the world. But when I'm thinking about this Yemenite Jew who came to live here in Israel, she probably would not compose this. She would love to hear it. But I think that she was probably like Hannah when going up to Shiloh, and she wanted something to have in her domestic life. She wanted a child. And what is the text that she is saying? What is the poetry that she has? Do we know? No. No, we don't know. She murmured, whispered. Her lips were moving. Nobody heard. Not her husband. Not the priest in Shiloh. Apparently somebody heard. So it wasn't an amazing piece of poetry. It, I, I don't know what it was. I can't tell. And I think this is the prayer that so many women that come from a marginal place, from an unprivileged place, that's the prayer that they have. Now, until today, we have the possibility, like Rabbi Lana at some point said, you can pray. Be quiet and pray. Say whatever you want. But this is this personal talk. So what is prayer? Is it always an organized text? Surely not. Has it got music? I believe a huge music, but we don't hear it. Like we don't hear the words. So uh, paradigmatically, I would say there are two types of prayers. There are prayers that were already written and we are privileged to join those prayers and feel if they match our feelings, but there are also prayers that we are the composers. And it's also relevant for men, I'm sure. But I think for women, being at home 
And at this particular moment, having a child with a fever or having some other problem, this is our intuition. It's this prayer. Lucky are those who can also read and also grab the book of Psalms or have great memory, but many of them don't. So this, I think, is indeed beautiful and definitely resonates also the Magnificat that we just heard. Um, but my question is, am I sure that Hannah wrote it? No. Or, I, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe someone wanted to help this woman to make her feelings come in a poetic way. So, I don't know how many prayers were really written by women. And unfortunately, before when I tried to print my other pages, as so I'll just tell you, uh, I, I brought the prayer of Esther and the prayer of Judith. I was trying to think about prayers, beautiful prayers, poetic prayers, prayers of, um, um, how do you say in English, um, comfort, to comfort people. So there are some songs. By the way, for most Jewish people, you will be surprised, and maybe you know today is the first of the month of Adar Bet. It's a privileged Shabbat that we have because it's the Adar Bet Aleph. I know it's confusing. It's Adar Bet Aleph. <laughs> Later, we can explain it to the people who don't understand. So anyway, it's the first day of the month. And in a very short while, the next full moon, we're going to be reading Esther's scroll. And it's, uh, it's very interesting that we don't have a prayer of Esther. I don't know if you know that uh, the Christians who do know, do you know Esther's prayer? Yeah, you know, right? Do you know that we don't have it in our Bible? No, we don't. In <laughs> Yeah, it's from the Septuagint. Now, maybe it was there, and then we took it out. I don't know. But it's quite amazing that in two weeks, we are going to speak very much about the brave woman. I don't understand. In the Septuagint, Esther has a very, very long song of praise, and we don't have it. Too bad, but okay. So we'll <laughs> settle with this one and with Deborah. Um, but I do want to go um, to the fact that if women don't speak too much, but I think that they speak a lot to God, and in Hebrew the word tefillah comes from the grammar, are three letters, pei lamed lamed, lefalel, pilel, which is really to talk. Uh, with time it is a, a special kind of talk, it's a talk which we call prayer. So anyway, because we women talk a lot with God, uh, I brought on the other side of the page something from modern times, like Rabbi Lana inspired us with the words of Rachel or Nomi Shemel. These are the words of an Israeli poet called Chava Pinchas Kohen. When I read this for the first time. She wrote it, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. It's a prayer. And when I read that, it just went like this into my heart. Because I'm also a mother of three children. Also, my children have fever, whether physically or mentally or whatnot. And I'm seeking a way to ask for their healing, for their good future. And I... Um, tell all the uh, Hebrew speakers, find the Hebrew version. I found this English version. I'm 100% sure that the Hebrew version is, is better. And Chava Pinchas Kohen, and the name of the song in Hebrew is, 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 do you remember? Okay. At the hour when I am about to cook porridge, May all my strange thoughts recede. And when I touch my baby's back to check his temperature, let all my troubles leave me. And not confuse my thoughts. Give me the strength 
to wash my face so that each one of my children will see his face in mine, like a mirror cleaned for a holiday. And may the darkness that is sunk within my face be covered with light, so that my patience not break, nor my throat grow parched from a troubled, sickening scream. May I not become powerless against the unknown, and may I never cease for even a moment to feel the touch of my children's flesh against my own. Give me your love so that I will have enough of it in me to stand at my doorway, sharing it simply as slicing bread and spreading butter each morning in you. The aroma of boiling milk overflowing and the lingering smell of coffee is an offering of thanks and an internal offering that I do not know how to give. Well, she's writing is that her home is the temple. She wants to give the offering of morning, of evening, and in the middle. And that's the woman's role. With or without a temple, her role is to give these offerings so that she herself, I don't want to use the word sacrifice, it may be too much, but she is able to give to the family, to the children, and not be hindered with all the thoughts and lack of faith. So this is asking God to do something in my house. This is not now asking God to fix the whole world. Just give me this daily strength to go along and to be able to give. So I thought this plus Hannah's song, they both feel my book of prayers. My book of prayers is not one set of prayers. And it's not just old prayers or new prayers. Anything that is a prayer and will fill me with hope and strength. So um, a little while ago, and then we have to finish so it'll be a very good ending, I got a it's not a call, but I got an email from uh, sisters with whom I have almost, I would say, family connections. And they asked me, please, can you record for us the words here? So I transliterated them here from Psalm 63. This is the first verse. And so I had to repeat times and again in the recording so that they can sing it. So what are the words? Elohim, Eli, God, my God. Ata ashacharecha. Uh, where is it? Earnestly, I seek you. Tsam alecha nafshi. My soul thirsts for you. Kama lecha besari. My body longs for you. And the end, which is also beautiful, is not sung. They just wanted these verses here. But the end is also beautiful. I'm in a, in a desert land and without water. So, so many times when we feel that we are in a desert land and there's no water, I'm saying, wow, of course we thirst. And when we thirst, one of the things that we do, we pray, we hope, we ask for. So... Um, Will you please put it? It's a French-speaking community. So I took the recording. And because you were asking me, Kathleen, to have something which is also shared, both uh, Jews and Christians, the psalm certainly shared. And um, this very, very personal thing. You see, it's not amending the entire world. It's just me in this desert condition. And I'm seeking for this water which is God, this very, very personal relationship. So let's see if it works.
Now it's a French community, so they will move to French. Thank you. I'm so sorry that we cannot continue for the last part, which is in Hebrew, because we are running out of time. Uh, but it is so personal, isn't it? It hasn't to be a grandiose piece of uh, writing. It hasn't got to be Homeric, Iliada, or I don't know what. It's just so, so personal. And I think this is where we all, whether we believe this way or the other way, this thirst for, for. <laughs> Very last thing before we uh, uh, close this, and tomorrow there's going to be a second part. And thank you so much, Kathleen, for allowing me to be twice here. Tomorrow it's going to be together with Rabbi Lana that we'll speak about uh, prayers. I will say that the way Shabbat is uh, entering into our homes, not what we do in synagogue which Lana brilliantly tried to share with you a little bit. It's much, it was much shorter than the synagogue, I can tell you. But when we go home, the prayers continue. And one of the things that we will sing, and maybe we're planning it for later, is from the book of Proverbs. And that is also a piece that you will hear tomorrow, uh, which is called Eshet Chayil, A Woman of Valor. אשת חיל מימצא, ורחוק מפנינים מכרעה, בטח בה לב בעלה, ולחם עצלות לא תאכל. One of the verses that I love most about the woman of valor is חגור נתנה לכנעני. She gave clothes to the Canaanite who lives in the land, to the stranger. So this is a very beautiful piece of poetry, but the way... We sing it, uh, it's not me, sorry, it's the men that sing to the women. Uh, in many places it is uh, interpreted to be a hymn, a song for the Shabbat. In my house, it is the husband who looks at the woman and say, you are a woman of valor and you are so praiseworthy. So sometimes I feel it is another way that we women are being tricked when this is taken to be just for Shabbat and not for us. So I wish us all to hear Women of Valor today and see it as the genius of women and also Shabbat. I'm ready to share. That's it. <laughs>
on Saturday uh, evening, like today, 8 o'clock, you pick up the telephone, Shavua Tov. This is what you say, good week. Okay? And if somebody calls you before Shabbat on Friday, when you say the end of the call, you say Shabbat Shalom. But you never pick up the phone by saying Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter. Some of you do that. Um, I do want to uh, mention something about the word uh, liturgy, because we use, uh, we use the word liturgy, and Lana, being a rabbi, uh, she was instructed how to lead liturgy. Um, I'm not a rabbi, so uh, I have the freedom uh, more to go to uh, poetry and to follow Hannah's lips and to uh, sort of identify with whatever feelings I have in whatever way I want to uh, say things. But I do want to explain first what is liturgy from an etymological point of view. And then I will tell the English speakers what is the equivalent in Hebrew for liturgy. Because liturgy is obviously a Greek word. It's a composed word. It's a composition of leitos, which means people, the public, the audience, the multitude. So first of all, liturgy is not a private thing. It's for the many. Now, it's always a kind of, a, a, I don't know if to say a paradox, I'll just wait. I don't want to interrupt. There was a mistake. There is literally... Okay. So there, is, there are like two extremes, and we have to leave them together because a prayer is a very personal thing. Right? Very personal. I think yesterday the speaker, the conductor, said, we are born alone, we die alone, and the question is what do we do in the middle with this loneliness? She spoke about music being a companion to the loneliness of the person. Of course, we talk about God being the companion to the lonely person. So the paradox in, in uh, prayer is that we do something very personal, but we actually want others to be with us. And it is so strong that in Judaism, uh, it was needed and is still needed to have a minyan, which is 10 people. So why is this insistence on this? Why, if it's personal, if it's between me and God, or it's like a person who is enjoying music, do I need someone else to enjoy the music so that I will enjoy the music? But apparently there is something about this togetherness. So liturgy is leitos, and the word orge, which means work. Later the orge, O-R-G, is a bit uh, moved with W in the front and K in the end is work. Okay, it's a Sanskrit um, uh, um, root, maybe root, yeah, source. And from that we get work and orge. You all know the name George, which is ge orge, someone who works the land. Okay, so. Um, so it is really, liturgy is something that is done with a group. It is structured. In ancient Greece, the word liturgy was not for prayer. Liturgy was something that the public made. For example, building a warship where you have to have ammunition. You, ha you needed people to pay for that. So one can say it was almost like a taxing system, but of great philanthropist. So liturgy was uh, working, making ships, was theatrical plays, and also, and also the religious work of the priests. So both Judaism and Christianity, a post-temple worshippers period, are restricting this word for the prayer which is conducted like by the master of the ship building or the master of the theater play. And the masters are the priests. So we still have something from temple period, we have the priests. So the priests are in charge of leading the prayer. And the priests also have their own prayers 
that should be said while nobody else can join. But they take the role of leading people even if they don't hear what they say. So where is that coming from? That the liturgy of the, let's say, the priests is sometimes limited only to them. If I am coming here to be with this togetherness, why are they saying something that is just them? So this is where we say that the priests are pretty much like Shelter. No, 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 no. Uh, no, what, what come, what, when you have the voltage very, very strong and you have to uh, have it minimized. You say transformator, like we say? Transformator? Okay, transformator. Yeah, yeah, transformator is when you take the electricity level, which is burning, and you transform it to something which is manageable. If I put my hand in the electricity, I'll, I'll, I'll die. So, I would say that liturgy, uh, coming from our temple and moving later to Judeo-Christian tradition, is definitely the priests trying to minimize the extreme energy of God to such that humans can cope with. Let me tell you that in the synagogue, sorry, in the temple, it was not allowed for everyone to enter certain parts. It was only for the priests, right? So why can a priest come in and out? Because he is the transformator. He's taking the... the, the no, 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 no. He's taking the strength, he's taking this energy of God and brings it out to the people. But how can people now participate? And the words became the tool to participate. If it was once the priest coming out and blessing the people, giving them the priestly blessing, they received the energy of God from the priests, which is still to the day to the, uh, day to day is done, right? The priests, in the, even in the, our society when there's no temple, anyone who is a Kohen, every Jewish person who is born to a Kohen family, and it can be also Khan, Khon, doesn't matter how you changed your name, but you know that you are a priestly descent, and this blessing is uh, given by the priests to the crowd. But the crowd wants to take part in worship, and they cannot enter the Holy of Holies. So how can they enter eventually into communion with everybody and with the priests and with God? By using their lips, by praying. But this prayer is structured. So liturgy is structured. You need someone to pull, yeah, to lead. Mm -hmm. You need someone to lead, but everybody is joining eventually. So there comes the Hebrew word, which I think at least Hebrew speakers will find it interesting. One of the words to work, to do work in the ground, is lifloach. In Arabic, they still use it, falach. Falach is someone who lifloach, poleach, to open the furrows in order to put the seeds. Okay, are you, some of you know the word in Arabic, falach? Yes. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So, the word that we use for liturgy is pulchan. That's the Hebrew equivalent for liturgy. When we speak here about a liturgy in, in Israel to uh, people who do not understand what liturgy is, they think it's only music. They do not understand that liturgy is any public work dedicated to God, led by someone, led by, so you can say the priest, the pastor, the one who moves the ship. Anyway, the equivalent is pulchan. For some of us, the word pulchan is associated with the idol worship. They do pulchan. We do the work of God. So yesterday, in the booklets that uh, Rabbi Lana gave us, I just want you to note that the prayer book really says in Hebrew, ha'avoda, work. Ha'avoda shebalev. So you can say pulchan and you can say avoda. 
Now, I think that is very much like the Latin, right? Opus Dei, right? Mm, yeah. Opus Opera is work? Yeah, yeah. 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 so it's work. Mm -hmm. But it is a very voluntary work. It's a work that you do, but it is organized. It is sort of a... a it's like a partitura in the concert. You cannot move here or there. So this is why I think that in our modern age, we are looking for things that are also personal. And in Lana's synagogue, it is a typical place where they do not follow only the liturgical code, but allow, as she gave us yesterday, Nomi Shemer and Rachel, and I gave you Chava Pinchas Kohen, and I will do another one in a minute. So I just wanted to say, if you do follow the liturgy, which is prescribed in Jewish um, custom, Jewish tradition, there's a very great emphasis on the Jewish journey, or the Hebrew journey, or the Israelite journey to the Promised Land. Yesterday, when Lana was praying the, uh, the blessing before uh, the meal, I was wondering how many of you follow that uh, when she says, Yom HaShishi, Vayichul HaShemayim V'Aretz V'Chol Tzva'am, it is Friday and uh, God has created, da -da -da, and now it is Shabbat, and the next verse was, Baruch Atah Adonai, Shotzi Otanu Me'Eretz Mitzrayim. So God brought us from Egypt. Now these are two different things. On Shabbat, we should evaluate the fact that we have the time with this very unique breaks of contemplative work, whatever you put into the understanding of Shabbat. The journey from Egypt, that's like a different story, isn't it? We should mention it on Pesach. No, we mention it every day, every day in our prayers. And on Friday night, when we celebrate the cosmos and time, we also put it. So what I want to say is that Jewish liturgy is also very much grounded in the history of the people. We cannot separate the two. It can be a very personal psalm, like we read this morning, lots of psalms before shachrit, before morning prayer, but also the psalms at times remind us that we came from Egypt. So I think that our liturgy is also rooted in history. But it's not just history. It's not just now speaking about, is that my problem? Should I not no, move? No, no. Okay. It is history, which I know we don't use it in the Jewish religion, but I will use it now. It is sacred history. It is Historia Sacra. Now this is a term that I learned from my Christian colleagues. We don't call it Historia Sacra, but we, it is sacred history because it means that there is a point. The Jewish people had undergone journeys and these journeys were from here to there and from there to here under all sorts of circumstances and we never forget it. So people that are rooted in history are also rooted in a land because history takes place in a land. And I think that's where our two religions sort of drifted a little bit to different emphasis. I don't know, it would be interesting if there are Christian prayers, liturgies, that specify the ground. But in the Jewish liturgy, we constantly say the word Zion. Blessed is God who brings us to Zion. And this liturgy is not necessarily written here. We speak about liturgy that is written here, but some of those liturgies were composed outside. They were composed in the diaspora. But the Jew is always walking, even if metaphorically or theologically, is walking to Zion. So this is like the heart, the heart. And this heart sends the blood to all sorts of places around the world, but it comes back again. So I think in Jewish liturgy, when we look at the fine-tuning of Jewish liturgy, it encompasses both wonder, wonder, the world, the cosmos, but also very, very specifically Jewish history and Jewish geography. I know that Christianity has 
deterritorized, right? Deterritorized. Um, maybe the sanctity, the history, uh, the notion of promise, but Judaism has remained, and I don't say it in a bad way, a tribal religion. It's a tribal religion. It talks about a family, which is the Jewish people, and it talks about a land. So maybe for this we need people like rabbis or cantors that will lead us into the liturgy. Um, one of the... Yeah, I have to give it to you, sorry. Uh, So, um, when, when we say, when we recited, and recited today, of course, again in the Shachrit, Shema Israel. Now, there's no very specific history or territory in this one. Shema Israel, here, O Israel, your God is one. But which is this God? It's the God that led you out of Egypt. It is something that comes to us like the second verse that we want to say. So I want to sh to, uh, for you to hear now an interesting interpretation of Shema Israel in music, uh, composed here by uh, monks. I think these are the Dormition monks, I'm not sure. Shema Israel. Now, when I heard that, I really, really was interested to hear how are they going to sing the Shema Israel? Is it going to be the long version, the short version? But then there was a surprise. A different sentence showed up. So I don't tell you what it is. For those who know the Shema, they will realize what is the difference. So after we hear it, uh, maybe Lana will want to say something about that. Anyway, later on, it will be Rabbi Lana's uh, turn to speak. OK. This is a very special rendition of Shema Israel because it's wonderful. And this is why we're closing our eyes because we want to have this kind of every word being put in its right place. But the last sentence was because it's Shema Israel. And you love your God with all your heart and your soul. Eh? But then the last phrase was, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Now for the Christians, <laughs> Wait, wait. So you see for the Jewish people, say, hey, what is he doing there? And for me, for me, it is clear that as a Christian, for you it is put together because Jesus put it together. Or sorry, it's not Jesus. It's this uh, lawyer when being asked, what were you told to do, right? This is in the Good Samaritan story. It's the lawyer who gives this answer. And Jesus says, yes, yeah, so just go and do it. But this composition of two ahavta, twice to love God and, and, uh, and the man, is a, is a composition that was put, at least for the first time, so closely together in the New Testament. So when we say Shema Israel, and we will say love God, <laughs> It will never end this way. So I think this is very nice, actually. That Shema Israel can be moved, and it is an inventive Shema Israel, because this is not the Shema Israel of the Bible. Not of our Bible, sorry, of the Hebrew Bible. 
of what you call the First Testament. Ruth, thank you. Of course, nobody says that it does not appear in the Bible and in Rabbi Akiva and by Rilel. I, I'm not saying that the Christians invented or that Jesus invented it. It's putting them together. If you are a person that knows the Jewish prayers, you just don't have that together. But what I think is that we see that liturgy is a growing organ. It's, it's continuously developing. It's never, it never stays one thing. It's based on, on the Bible, on the Hebrew Bible, and then it adds other things. And I don't know, maybe you tell me that you sing it every time in church, but uh, for me at least it was a surprise to hear Shema Israel and love thy neighbor as thyself. Do you have that in the church? Do you sing it together? Yeah? The Shema Israel and? No, no we do as, as a, a singing, but in different prayers and different singings and, you know, yeah, choirs and different moments. No specific continues always the same. Uh-huh. Depending on what it does, we have the expression very often. Okay. So for, for us, it's a, it's a surprise, it's beautiful, it's a, it's a sort of a novelty. So I think with this, um, if I'll just conclude, what I wanted to say is first, that liturgy is something that we do together, although we are alone with whomever we turn our prayers to, okay? But we do that together, and that is one element in liturgy which is surprising. So the word liturgy, I said, was borrowed from the Greek world, but was now concentrated to only religious worship, not any more ships and theaters and other things. We did keep the idea that there should be a person that leads the liturgy. In the world of Christianity, the priest, just like the priest in the temple. In the world of Judaism, not necessarily a rabbi. You would say who is the leader of the prayer. And lastly, I said, the Jewish prayer is centered on history. The exodus of Egypt is daily mentioned and Zion as the end station of the way. So this is just another dimension of the liturgy, which is not just looking, not just, it's a, a part and a extra to looking at the cosmos or having our personal prayers. A Jewish person cannot pray without mentioning exodus and Zion. Okay, bye bye, Lana. So maybe I'll first connect um, to what Iska just said, and then I'll do a little shift for the time that we have. So for Ahafkal Alachakamocha, first of all, I want to connect everybody because the Israelis or the, the Hebrew speakers or the Jewish friends among us know the story, so they immediately jumped <laughs> intuitively because, but I'm not sure that everybody you know in the same So I'll say that. In our um, history, there is a story in Midrash about some say Rabbi Hillel, some say Rabbi Akiva, maybe both, that the person came to them and asked, tell me the Bible on one, uh, like quickly, standing on one foot, tell me everything there is to know. Tell me the bottom line. Yeah, <laughs> the bottom line. So the rabbi uh, took a deep breath and looked at the person who was asking the question and he said, Ve'ahavta l'racha kamocha. And love your neighbor as if it were yourself. The rest, go and learn. <laughs> and it really became that if we really go to the bottom line or summarize everything, 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 the first thing that we need to do is to be good and kind for everybody, regardless of everything. We really need to love everyone like we love ourselves. And everything else, we should learn. It also connects to Yom Kippur which is uh, the holiest day of the year uh, for the Jewish people, for the Jewish tradition, uh, the Day of Atonement. And actually, that day, it doesn't start on that particular day, because we call also Yom Kippur Yom Adin, the Day of Judgment. But it's not one day. It's not 24 hours. There's like a whole process that leads to it. And actually, the process starts even with the previous months. Yom Kippur is celebrated in the month of Tishrei, that currently, in the modern era, it's the first month of the Jewish calendar. Why I say currently? Because at the biblical time, it wasn't the first month. The first month was actually the month of Nisan, when we celebrate Passover, which is actually the next month in the calendar. 
But nowadays it's Tishrei, a long story how it came to be, we'll keep it for next time. Uh, and Yom Hadin, Yom Kippur, is the tenth of the months of Tishrei. But the process starts way before. First of all, ten days beforehand, the celebration of the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. And 30 days earlier, we have a different month, and that's the month of Elul. And during the month of Elul, we start preparing ourselves spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Uh, we do the acts and the deeds that God is basically wants us to do in order really to come 40 days after the beginning of Elul, after we've already celebrated the Jewish New Year, and we come to Yom Kippur, and we're ready with the knowledge that whatever is coming, it's not because of those 24 hours that we usually um, uh, cast. We fight, we fast, and we pray, and we do a lot of attributes. But that's not, that's like the icing, right? That's the, the last step. But during those 40 days leading towards it, we really need to prepare ourselves. And we always talk about two kind of uh, kinds of mitzvot, two kinds of good deeds. One kind is between the person himself and the creator, and Adam Lamakom. <laughs> the good things that we need to do within our relationship to God. The other kind of deeds are between Ben Adam and between ourselves and our friends, our neighbors, the people that we are in a relationship with. And God is telling us really, really clearly, don't come to me to ask for forgiveness before you did that with the people around you. Because it doesn't worth anything. All the people were created equally in front of the same God. So if you want to come and redeem yourself in front of God, first you need to work hard. And you need to make sure, you need to make amends with the humankind, with the, with the people around you. And that, of course, connects to the Ahavka and the Moha. First, we need to be good and kind to everybody around us. And once we do that, God sees that. <laughs> then we already come when we stand in front of him, then it's okay. We're going to be okay. So actually, I would like to sing that phrase. Because when I was ordained as a rabbi, it only happened last summer, that that was a tune, both uh, musically, but also uh, li liturgically, that was basically leading me and my cohort towards uh, the ordination. The words say, Hareni mekabelet alai, I accept on myself. It's almost like an oath. I accept on myself. The mitzvah, the commandment of God, of the Creator, the hafel and the hakamocha. If you want to join me, it will be lovely. If not, you can hear the melody. <laughs> subject of women into all of this, <laughs> into the world of the liturgy, of the prayer, of the pulpit. And I will start by stating the obvious. I'm sure that there are people in this room, and not be embarrassed, it's okay, I was one of the ones, that it's uncomfortable and maybe not understandable for them to see a female rabbi. It's relatively a new concept in the world. And I'm sure, by the way, it's equally strange or weird or uncomfortable, both for the Jews and for the Christians alike. I think there are many, many uh, streams within Christianity that it's completely unacceptable. 
And there are several streams within Christianity that already also have female pastors and uh, leaders and so on. <laughs> and it's exactly the same within Judaism. For the most part, whether a Jewish person articulates or identifies themselves nowadays in 2022 as an Orthodox or as a secular alike, to see a woman rabbi, that's really, 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 really far out of our comfort zone. I'll give you an example. I have a very, very good friend. Um, she is very, very secular, and her entire family is very, very secular, really no religious uh, anything in their lives. And her cousin was about to have this bar mitzvah, uh, and uh, they were looking for a rabbi to do it. So she called me, and then she says, I really need your help. And I was like, sure, I'm, I'm happy to. What's the problem? And she says, my nephew is about to have a bar mitzvah, and we're really looking for a rabbi that will be liberal, and very sort of uh, open-minded and can do, you know, different things, not, not, not orthodox. She says, God forbid, not orthodox. <laughs> that rabbi cannot be orthodox, but the rabbi needs to be Amen. a man. <laughs> and I was, okay, so why are you calling me? <laughs> I mean, I can, uh, you know, I can be okay for the first uh, definition of being a rabbi, but I'm clearly not a man. I also have another friend who's a female rabbi, phenomenal, really phenomenal. Uh, her name is Tamal, Tamal Gugauze, and she vetted over 500 weddings in Israel. Unbelievable. She is the female that uh, really made the ceremony of, uh, the, of the wedding in Israel more than any other. And she also always says when she's uh, in public and giving interviews that she gets phone calls from time to time. And what she hears is, I'm looking for a rabbi just like you, just exactly someone who will do just like you, but a man. <laughs> okay. Now that we put some humor into the story, then we can have the serious conversation, right? <laughs> that would be a First of all, I want to say, women and liturgy, women and prayer, it's not a new thing. It's not a new thing. The only thing that happened is that we a little bit forgot history, <laughs> history. But it's not a new thing. Iska was talking about Hannah yesterday, and there are other examples in the Bible of women praying and women taking leadership position, even if they were not called in that position. But in terms of what they were doing and their behavior, they were definitely such. And the reason that I was was thinking sort of uh, what inspired me to talk about it, particularly nowadays we're leading towards uh, March 8th, the Women's International Day, and so on and so forth. But there's another day, March 18th, exactly 100 years ago, on March 18th, 1922, there was a very, very famous rabbi in the United States of America. His name was Rabbi Kaplan, that uh, basically initiated a particular stream in Judaism, which we call the Reconstructionist Movement. If you'd like to know more about it, I'm happy to sit with you over lunch and uh, tell you all the details. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a very, very liberal uh, <coughs> sort of stream within Judaism. It basically calls Judaism as a centralization. He wrote a phenomenal book about it, several. And when his daughter, Judith, you would be third 12, and she saw that all of her male classmates are having a celebration of Bar Bat Mitzvah. I'm sure everybody knows, but just to tune us all to speak the same language, it's uh, a ceremony that a Jewish youngster, uh, for boys at the age of 13, for girls at the age of 12, because let's face it, girls grow up a little bit faster, we all know that, so Judaism puts the <laughs> So we're doing it a year earlier. Anyhow, uh, and there's a ceremony which is very, very beautiful. It really is almost like to take, take a personal commitment within Judaism and the Jewish people. And it's celebrated in a very particular way, traditionally. It's the day that we receive ownership on the Torah. What does it mean to receive ownership? Not only to sit somewhere on the bench on the second floor in the Orthodox synagogue and to follow along maybe what the men are doing downstairs while they're reading the Torah, but it's actually to own it. What does it mean? To open the Bible, to read from it, to learn it, to memorize it, and the climax of this process is a big celebration in a synagogue or in a beautiful setting outdoors 
when the whole family gathers together and we give the Torah to the grandparents and then to the parents and then the parents give it to the child who celebrates and then that child comes up to the bima, to the elevated area of the sanctuary and reads out loud in front of all the um, people that gather there the weekly portion that that child was born into. And it's very, very moving and it really is a commitment to say, I am part of the Jewish people and I own it. Not because I was born to it, not because my parents decided, but because I decided. I want to take ownership on it. And of course, within the Israeli society and outside of the Jewish world, everybody knows that that's what boys do at the age of 13. And they begin to prepare for it a long time in advance. Okay. But what about the girls? So when Rabbi Kaplan, 100 years ago, and his daughter Judith at the age of 12, looked around and saw all of her classmates, the male classmates, having this process and going up to the door, she came to her father, the rabbi, and said, hello, <laughs> I'm here, what about me? By the way, interestingly enough, the rabbi Kaplan did not think about it by himself. Mm-hmm. But luckily enough, Judith, who did at the age of 12, <laughs> came to her father and said, I also want to be part of that. I also want to do that. And actually, he wrote in his memoirs that at the beginning, he really did not know how to take it. Because it was really not the way that people did things. But uh, luckily for us, he loved her dearly. And he really wanted her to have the same experience. And then he made a research. And in his research, he went into the Jewish law the orthodox rabbis that were writing things about what you can and cannot do. And he did not find anywhere, in any place, that someone said that girls cannot read from the Torah. Why do you think that nobody wrote about that before? Because it was not prohibited. Ever. <laughs> it was never prohibited. Girls and women always could read Torah. And then, of course, the question that comes up immediately is this, when on earth, in our history, and by whom, <laughs> the new, new tradition came along saying that only men are obliged to keep commandments, and only men are obliged to pray, and only men are obliged to read Torah, and only men can be cantors or lead prayers. And only men can be rabbis. Well, I have no news for you. Nobody ever did. (laughs) Nobody ever written anywhere that is only for men. And therefore, exactly 100 years ago, this month, on March 18th, was the first bat mitzvah in America that opened up the gates a little bit. A little bit later, somewhere in the 50s or maybe in the 60s, there was another daughter of another rabbi. <laughs> I actually mentioned him yesterday, Abraham Joshua Heschel, one of the most inspirational leaders of the 20th, 20th century. It was a fascinating biography. We'll also keep it for lunch. His daughter, <laughs> Susanna Heschel, today she's a professor, Susanna Heschel. She really was supposed to be rabbi, Susanna Heschel. And the only reason that she's a professor, not that that's not good, that's phenomenal, but the reason she's a professor and not a rabbi, because when she wanted to follow the footsteps of her father, and she came to the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and she knocked on the doors of the dean, and she said, I am Susanna Heschel. I am the daughter of Abraham Joshua Heschel, and I would like to be a rabbi. You know what she was told? was told the following sentence. Women will belong at the synagogue Bima, leadership positions, when an orange (laughs) will belong to a Seder place. That's me. So, women will belong to the Bima when an orange will belong to a Seder plate. To Pesach plate. Pesach. Huh? Pesach. Yeah, to the Pesach uh, plate. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how many of you have had a chance to, like to celebrate Pesach, Pesach, Pesach night. Or, or the Pesach, or the Pesach plate. Great. <laughs> so 
I do. When we celebrate Passover, right? We call it Seder. Why, by the way, we call it Seder? Oh, seder right. in Hebrew is an order. It means everything is mesuda. Everything is in order. Everything in place. We have a, an entire book <laughs> that tells us exactly how to do Passover night. Really, instructions. <coughs> so among the instructions, we also instructed what to put on the plate, which represents different symbols of the story of the Exodus from Egypt that we are telling out loud that night. And we have an egg, and we have bitter herbs, and we have something sweet, and so on and so forth. Nowhere in the instructions it said there needs to be an orange. <laughs> but that was the response of the Jewish Theological Seminary when Susanna Heschel wanted to become a rabbi. So guess what? What's your name? Tova. Tova has an orange on her center plate. I have an orange on my center plate. Why? You have an orange on your no, center plate? No, I didn't know it's that. Not make sure that this year you're going to have an orange on your center plate. <laughs> That's surprising. So, <laughs> maybe a pomelo. <laughs> it symbolized the allegory. If it belongs, because that was the answer. So if the orange now can be on the center plate, I can stand here and be a rabbi. And you're laughing, but it's very, very important. There are thousands, if not mil, I don't know, maybe not millions, but there are hundreds of thousands for sure, Jewish families around the world that ever since Susanna Heschel got that response are having really? orange on their center plate. And it. here the wonder has happened, and we have female rabbis. Another story, a little bit more tragic, but it's important for me to bring her spirit into this room. In the 1930s, there was a dear, dear woman in Berlin, Germany. Jonas. Her name was Regina Jonas. Jonas. Yeah. Regina grew up in an Orthodox household. The word reform, by the way, was born in Germany in the 19th century. But Regina grew up in a completely and entirely Orthodox setting. She grew up in a very, very uh, poor family. It was just her mom, her brother, and herself. But her mom really invested in her education, in her Jewish education. She was studying at the best schools in terms of learning Jewish theology and practice and so on and so forth. And she was the only girl in her classroom. And all the boys that were in her classroom, or not all, but many, continued further on their Jewish education and became rabbis. And she became a teacher. A Judaic studies teacher, and that was for women back then in the 1930s in Berlin, the top. And she started thinking, why? I mean, I'm good in teaching. I mean, Rabbi is also a teacher, but I want to do more. I want to serve a congregation. I want to lead prayer, and so on and so forth. And she fought for that. She went to the highest possible institution at that time in Berlin, Germany, for Judaic studies. And she did absolutely everything as her colleagues who were male and they were studying to be rabbis. She came to a very famous rabbi back then in Berlin. His name was Leo Beth. Maybe some of you have heard of him. And she asked him, look, right? she brought a portfolio. This is everything I've studied. You can test me written. You can test me orally. Whatever you want. I want to get a rabbinic ordination. And Leo Beck was really a leader of the co-community back then. And he said, I'm sorry, but nobody has done it before me, and I cannot be the first. And then she went to a very, very long list of rabbis who were really famous in the community for five years. For five years, she went from one city in Germany to the other and to the other and to the other. And all she wanted is for somebody to ordain her as a rabbi. And only after five years, and after she wrote a thesis with nine points, proving her point, <laughs> halakhically, according to the Jewish law, not something that we, she was dreaming about at night, according to the Jewish law, why women are eligible exactly the same as men to serve as rabbis. After five years showing this thesis to many, 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 many different rabbis, she found a rabbi who was not as famous or as familiar and not in a capital city, but somewhere in Germany, and she got her ordination. 
and she was serving the community both in uh, Hamburg and both in Berlin during very, very challenging times. At the end of the 1930s, she was the leading role in the Oranien Burgestrasse, the main synagogue in Berlin, with everything that was happening in Germany in those days. And eventually, unfortunately, at the beginning of the 1940s, she and her mom were uh, taken from Berlin to a camp called Theresienstadt in the Czech Republic, or Czechoslovakia at that time. She didn't know she was coming back, and she wanted to preserve her heritage. So what she did, she took this thesis that she wrote, one photograph of herself, the diploma that says that she was ordained as a rabbi, and a few more articles that she had written. And she took it all, put it in an envelope, and gave it to the Jewish archive of the Jewish community of Berlin. And went on the train. When she was in Theresienstadt, we know about her today, that she was working, she was almost like a community organizer. She was a people's person. She was uh, on the train stations accepting the newcomers that would come to the camp. And she would be working with the elderly and with the sick and with the children. And on Saturdays, she would teach Torah and she would lead services and she would lead the prayers. She did really, she was everywhere. She was there for two years. Two very, very famous people, both of them are men, were with her at the camp and survived and wrote books. One of them was Leo Beck, mm -hmm. Rabbi Leo Beck. The, one of the fathers of reform movement, there is a very, very important and large campus in Israel, in Haifa, a school named after him and, and other places in the world. The other one was Viktor Frankl, maybe you know the same also, a yeah, great uh, philosopher, wrote a famous, several, but his most famous book is uh, Man in Search of uh, Meaning, uh, both of them were working on a daily basis with her, and they survived the war, and wrote books and became very famous, and they knew about her there, and they never, never mentioned her. Fast forward, she passed away, of course. She was uh, murdered from a resident that she moved to, was moved to Auschwitz-Birkenau, and that was the end of her life. I fast forward in the 70s in America, that's already one generation after Susanna Heschel and the Orange Story, the reform movement in America ordained the first woman they thought ever to be a rabbi. Her name was Sally, I think the year was 72, if I'm not mistaken, and it was a big celebration, and everybody thought that she was the first woman ever. But in the 90s, when the Berlin Wall collapsed, and for the first time after so many years, it was possible to reach both sides of the city of Berlin, and the archive of the Jewish community was on the eastern side. So it took a few more years after the collapse of the wall, after the communists left, and so on and so forth, but finally, they got to the safe at the Jewish archive, and they opened it, and they took up the envelope with her signature on the envelope. And for the first time, after six years or so, we found out that there was a woman. Regina. Her name was Rabbi Regina Jonas. And she was a phenomenal and outstanding person, a rabbi, a prayer leader, a community worker, and so on and so forth. And Sally, in the 70s, was not the first. <coughs> but it happened so earlier in time and completely erased from history because of historical circumstances. <coughs> I have a lot to say, but our time is about our time is about to, to end, and I want to make sure that we have time to rest before the concert. I just want to say, as a conclusion, there are many, many, many stories. I just told you three stories from the 20th century but I actually brought a book that tells many, many, many different stories over the term of thousands of years of history, from the Bible throughout uh, the Talmudic time and uh, the medieval uh, ages time of women prayers, women doing liturgy, women leading, whether they were called or not called rabbis, but that's what they were. So today, I'm very, very proud to live in the world of 2022 that although it is still strange, <laughs> And that's still uncomfortable, 
And still we get phone call, can you recommend a male colleague? <laughs> but at the same time, in the state of Israel today, there are close to 250 female rabbis from various denominations, reform, conservative, even orthodox. And in the world, we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands more. So A, it's possible. B, it was never prohibited. Three, it's wonderful. <laughs> And I will conclude with uh, words that Esh, uh, uh, Iska and I thought of together, but in different, sitting in different rooms, but we thought of the same. Because again, as we were saying all along, liturgy and prayer can come in different shapes and forms. At the end of the day, it is personal. When we stand before God and say whatever we say, nobody knows. But in order to put it into words and publish it and print it on a piece of paper, there are really various shapes and forms. And nobody owns it. It is very, very personal, and it also belongs to everybody at the same time. So there was a wonderful poetess, one of the greatest that we have known, Leah Goldberg, that wrote many poetry and also wrote a lot of liturgy. And in one of the poems, which is also a liturgy, she is asking, God to teach her the words, how to, how to pray. Mm -hmm. It's not like we get up in the morning and we, and we know what to say, right? So she's asking for assistance. She's saying, teach me, my God, a blessing, a prayer, on the mystery of a withered leaf, on ripened fruit so fair, on the freedom to see, to sense, to breathe, to know, to hope, to despair. Teach my lips a blessing, a hymn of praise, as each morning and night you renew your days. Lest my day be as the one before. Lest routine set my ways. What page? What page is this? <laughs> 85? 85? Um, so I'll, we'll conclude with uh, the words of Dan Golda. There are many, many melodies. Also, maybe I'll say this. You know, yesterday, after the uh, service that we did in the synagogue, a lot of the Israeli people uh, came to me and said, Oh, I know the words, but for different melodies, right? It's like this and that. So I just want to say that, again, words belong to everybody. <coughs> And there are many, many, many melodies because many people were inspired by the liturgy. So everybody wanted to compose it. And of course, you know, we grew up in a certain way. And the melodies that we know the best are the melodies that we heard as we were little, as we were growing up, uh, with our families, with our synagogues. That's what we know. And sometimes it's really uncomfortable to take us out of what we know. And suddenly we know this, but it sounds a little bit different. But it's okay. Let us experience. The melody that I'll choose is by Moshe Ratsyuk. Actually, I used to be a musician once upon a time, and I was actually... I, I took the words to him. I was singing in his choir. Moshe Ratsyuk? Moshe Ratsyuk. Ah, and I took it, I, I, I photo it and brought it to him, and he composed the... the so come sing with me. Okay, I sing from him. Okay. So I say, I used to be a musician a long time ago, and I was uh, working as a choir repetitor with uh, opera singers. And this was one of the first uh, melodies that uh, I've learned long, long, long time ago for these lyrics. So, and although I heard many, many melodies after for these lyrics, I also am loyal to the one that I heard first. <laughs> Yeah. 